Okay. Normally when I practice with small arms, I feel very comfortable because I've handled various firearms for all of my adult life. But when it comes to swords, I'm not so good. So I'm gonna treat this very, very carefully. Um, this is a real sword. It is very sharp. Um, and I have no idea why my niece and her husband gave it to me. But it's cool. Okay. And uh, I, I have a feeling that they gave it to me because they know that um, I've taught on the armor of God before, and the sword of the spirit is mentioned there, which is the word of God. And uh, we'll have a little discussion about um, the sword of the spirit today. But, you know, I wanted to just kind of draw your attention to how, um, how much of a deadly weapon this is. I mean, this this would kill you faster than most bullets would. Okay, and it uh, it the Romans they were really good at military stuff, and uh, they were good at coming up with different ways of executing people. Like they made an art form out of crucifixion. It was not invented by them, but it was certainly developed by them so that uh, they executed the, uh, their prisoners primarily with that. But uh, they they did other bad things to to kill people as well, including this sword. One of the reasons that they were so uh, effective in battle, if you were to watch the movie. Uh, I think it's called The Gladiator with um, Russell Crowe from, I don't know, 20 years ago or so. <laughs> there are some very historically accurate uh, scenes involving the Roman soldiers in combat. And they all had uh, these big square shields that locked together so that there was a whole flank of of um, uh, shields in, made into an impenetrable wall. And there would be a, a second row of taller soldiers right behind them that would have a second uh, flank of uh, shields all locked together. So it, like one, they were uh, solid and sturdy. And they had <laughs> developed this sword, it's called a machaira. They used a couple different kinds of swords, but the machaira is uh, what's described as the sword of the spirit, and it's because the Roman uh, citizens and those people in the Roman Empire, which was where uh, the New Testament was, was um, produced, would have um, understood the the sword of the spirit in that context it's deadly sharp um it can be used not just as an as an offensive weapon but as a defensive weapon and it is so sharp it can penetrate a bone and um you know slice the bone open and separate the bone from the marrow which is the analogy of the sword of the spirit, uh, very, um, very sharp, uh, formidable weapon. And I just wanted to give you the visual picture of that 
uh, before we begin today. Um, this is made in South Africa. Very interesting. I will put it away. If anyone desires to see it later on, I'd be happy to take it out and show it to you, but don't just come up and pull it out of the scabbard because it's uh, very sharp. It scares me. It was like, I shouldn't bring it. I should bring it. Good, good visual tool. All right, let's um, open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise you for your sword of the spirit, your written word that we can know your incarnate word. We praise you for the Holy Spirit that illuminates uh, the written word so that we can know your son, the incarnate word, even better. I pray that you would drive the distractions of today out of our minds and our hearts so that we can just focus on you and on your son. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. All right, let's turn to Hebrews and chapter four. Before I slice my thumb. Okay, and <laughs> let's see. This chapter begins with therefore. And it always begs the question, what is the therefore, therefore? The author has just turned to the example of uh, the time when Israel moved from being a really big family, um, you know, a few hundred thousand people, to a nation where God... Um, delivered them from bondage as a family and gave them a law, gave them his, um, his instruction so that they were no longer just a uh, big family. They were now uh, a nation. And they followed his directions at Passover, that very first one, and he delivered them from this bondage and they went out into the wilderness. And in just a few days, after all those miracles that they went through, in just a few days, um, they started turning back to Egyptian gods. So God delivered them, but they began to look at worldly things of their own creation to sustain them. And because of their lack of faith, as I mentioned earlier today, um, God had them wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And that generation, except for just a couple individuals, were not allowed to see the promised land. So every adult who was alive um, at that time, except for Moses and Caleb and Joshua, um, died in the wilderness. I was thinking there was a fourth guy, but I guess I was wrong. Um, so put this day on the calendar. <laughs> um, um, they were the product of their own um, unfaithfulness, unbelievingness. And so, therefore, the writer's brother Jews, um, he's calling them out to not harden their hearts uh, to God's deliverance like their forefathers did, um, but hold on to your messianic hope and, in fact, see Jesus in that messianic hope. So, let's Read verse one, therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, less, uh, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. Let us fear lest any of you should 
seem to have failed to reach it, to reach that rest, okay? The us he's talking about, again, is not the us of the church. It is the us of Israel, his countrymen, the Jews. He's saying now is the time that um, Messiah has come. He is the Lord Jesus, um, who is God, uh, very God, and very human. In verse 2, for good news came to to us, just as to them, the forefathers. But the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. They, were, they got the message. It was delivered to them, but they were not united in faith. There certainly was a remnant who believed but they were not of a mind together. Um, this word, uh, good news, sometimes it's translated in, in uh, scripture as, as the gospel in the New Testament, and it's used si over 60 times in the New Testament. Um, you are legalizo. Or legalizo. It's a really tongue twisted word, but it, it means literally news that is good, right? And it's almost always translated either as good news or as the word gospel. We often forget what the gospel is. So, what did the children of Israel who were looking towards God's promised land, um, what was preached to them? Okay. The beginnings of the gospel of the kingdom were what was preached to them, that they would have rest and an eternal kingdom in God's Messiah in a promised land that God had promised Father Abraham. They hadn't yet received the law when they um, had received this word. Um, they had not yet become a nation. Uh, they didn't have the um, their King David or the Davidic covenant where God promised them uh, through David's, uh, through this covenant with David, that there would be a, um, a man who would sit on David's throne forever. And uh, so they were missing a lot of what we today know as the good news, but the good news that they had was a promised rest in this promised land. So by the time Jesus came along, the gospel of the kingdom was fully developed, and it's what Jesus and John the Baptist both preached along the Jordan River and elsewhere this gospel of the kingdom, though, um, is um, not yet ripe. Okay, turn with me, leave your finger in Hebrews, turn with me over to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul has received um, a special revelation from the Lord Jesus by way of some kind of a vision, not just a feeling or a gift of knowledge, but he was taught by the Lord Jesus himself in his glorified state. In chapter 15, of starting at verse 1, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance, there's nothing more important to Paul, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scripture, 
that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas or Peter, then to the 12. Then he appeared more than 500 times, uh, to, I'm sorry, to 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive when he wrote this, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I uh, persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. The great Popeye verse, I say, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that was with me. And we'll just stop it there. So that does not sound like the gospel of the kingdom that Jesus said, you know, behold, the kingdom of God is at hand. Um, it's not the, the gospel of the kingdom in its infant understanding before they even had the law where they were promised a rest in Christ Jesus or in God's anointed one uh, in the promised land. So the we can flip back to Hebrews now. So the, um, the, the good news that their forefathers had received was rudimentary leading toward Christ and leading some toward Christ, toward God's Messiah, but they did not have a unity of faith and um, they became very unfaithful as a as a national character of their people uh, except for the remnant so <clears throat> the jewish audience of this epistle okay, had this special position with god including a special knowledge through the old testament and their whole upbringing for generation after generation after generation, and a special relationship with God, um, whereas the Gentiles had no hope because they did not have the things of God, but the Jews did. Um, he says to his brethren, you had the law and the prophets, you have heard about um, God's Messiah, and you, by now, it's a generation after Jesus' death um, and before the destruction of the temple. Um, he says, you've heard about Jesus' life, his death, his burial, his resurrection. You can see that Jesus lines up with the um, Torah, the law, and the prophets, the, the uh, whole Tanakh. You um, now you have to unite that faith so that you believe. Right? You have a great messianic hope. He's telling his brethren in these first few chapters, we will come and set, or he will come and set up his kingdom, the fruition of the gospel of the kingdom, which is all about Jesus, and he will reign as David's. Um, offspring, the son of David, on David's throne forever. Uh, the completion of Paul's portion of uh, the gospel. So don't let that opportunity for so great salvation drift away. Believe in Jesus, he's telling them. This is written specifically to Jews who had that uh, cultural. Uh, relationship with God, um, but it does go to all people, just like even though we were not under the law, the law will hold us 
accountable. We are accountable to the law. Um, there are people today, you may know some, who have a, a knowledge of the Bible. Uh, they could be great great uh, Bible scholars and thinkers, and yet they don't know Jesus. They have not put their faith in Jesus. They look at the Bible as a good philosophical book, a good way to teach us how to live and that sort of thing, and they have even studied the scriptures, but individually they have not brought together what they've heard in scripture with faith. That's where the writer here is going. Let's read uh, verse three. The very beginning says, for we who have believed enter that rest. We who have believed enter that rest. The children of Israel relied on the fact that they were Abraham's offspring unto salvation, right? They still have that belief that they are Abraham's seed unto um, salvation, so they are automatically saved. There is no, um, there that salvation is not even in their vocabulary. It is resident in them, they, they would say. And their hope is, though, in Abraham and not in God, and certainly not in his Messiah, um, Jesus. But he says, for we who have believed in Messiah and that Jesus is Messiah, as he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. God's work was done when he began his work of building the earth and, and time and space and all of that. He already had it in his mind what the total outcome was going to be. And his work was already finished before he began. That's, that's what a good uh, builder is going to do. They're going to have the, the plans already laid out. They're going to have the materials already on hand. And they're going to have the tools necessary to do the job. And so they can see in their mind's eye, it's already done. And that makes it go smoothly. But even more so, God, who is the author of uh, time and space, the creator of what we know as time, uh, had all of that already finished before um, he even started his work in laying the foundation. The writer here dips back into Psalm 95 again. There's a couple more Psalm 95 quotes here. We're not going to turn there. But <clears throat> um, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. That was something that God already had ordained, that they, they, their uh, unfaithfulness and disobedience would prevent them from enjoying his rest. And he's calling the, the, the writers to, um, to accept uh, their faith in Jesus and rest in him. So remember, well, although his work was finished from the foundation of the world, so even though he was done before he started the foundation, it was already uh, known by God that his chosen people were not going to enter his rest. And if you think about it, Jesus is the, the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. God already knew, one of the men mentioned this morning in the remembrance, that Jesus, that that. Jesus was going to necessarily um, have to die, that God was going to 
um, be the one on the cross in the form of his anointed one, Jesus, the Messiah. David said to God that God knew me in my mother's womb as he knit me together. So God already sees the end result um, and has, for his glory, um, ordained that ahead of time, long before any of us could even conceive of time and space. Paul in, in Ephesians in the first chapter wrote, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight in love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Christ Jesus in accordance with the pleasure of his will. And yet, even though he was done with his work at the foundation, he already knew, had ordained in some fashion, that the children of Israel would not enter his rest because of their disobedience. Not because he said, you're not going to believe, but because he said, you are not going to believe. So I am not going to let you enter my rest. So whatever God was going to do with and through his son was finished before he laid the cornerstones of his heaven and his earth and all of the universe. Because it was his will and it glorified him. And the author's point here is, it's up to the individual Jew, but all of us as well, to unite what they know with their faith. It's, it's a very impassioned plea he's giving them. Verses four and five. For he has somehow spoken of the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all his work. And again, in this passage, he said, they shall not enter my rest. So God's work was finished on the sixth day. Then he rested and watched things unfold. And... Uh, yet he was still active in his creation. Uh, so many um, historians that want to paint the picture of America as anything other than a Christian nation uh, or a nation that was heavily influenced by the Bible and by Bible believers um, will teach that the earliest founding fathers were deists which basically means that God created everything at, like a clock and wound it up and put it on a shelf and just watched it and had no interaction with it. He just enjoyed what he made. And yet we know <clears throat> that he was and still is active and leaving his fingerprints everywhere in his creation. So. This, uh, again, um, goes back, they shall not enter my rest, to Psalm 95. What the children of Israel saw in the wilderness, all of the miracles that they had seen in Egypt and then in the wilderness, they never united with their faith. They never brought those things together. They never allowed those things to um, bring them to faith. And so that their lack of faith meant that they did not enter God's rest in the promised land. Now, the, the Roman Catholic Church um, teaches that Jesus died on the cross. Absolutely. But they don't teach that he died for them personally. And they don't believe or they don't teach that his shed blood is sufficient for salvation. Some of you have, have come out of the Catholic Church and know that church tradition carries a very 
um, very weighty role in their theology uh, because they say that the original um, people who set up the church and through the ages were inspired by God to make certain interpretive decisions over the, the word. And so they hold tradition to be um, high, as high as or higher than scripture. And they require specific um, seven, actually seven different sacraments, um, most of which are required for salvation, uh, including uh, taking the Eucharist and participating in that. And if you're excommunicated from the church, they say, you can't participate in that any longer. And so therefore you have no place in salvation. And they hold that somewhat as a, um, a point of fear over people. So individual Roman Catholics might read the Bible uh, they might um, see and hear the truth, but like the Jews of old, they're not uniting what they see in Scripture, the totality of Scripture, and they're not uniting that with, with any measure of faith. They are uniting it with their works, saying that the church says we have to do these things. I remember... Uh, years ago when when we had um, television still um, back in California I don't like saying that anymore but um, I used to listen to Fox News sometimes and Bill O'Reilly was one of the men who was prominent then in Fox News and he was Roman Catholic and he talked about selling certain items in his little web store and you could buy you know hats or pens or coffee mugs or whatever with patriotic themes or whatever uh, that particularly rose from his show and i remember on a couple of occasions him saying that all of his money he donates to particularly catholic charities um, all of the money that comes from these because he's really hoping that when he meets god that he will have been found to have done enough. And uh, it was a very sad situation, marrying the law or bringing in um, and uniting the law with your works. That's what the Jews did then. And as a national character, that's what they do now. Praise God, there are many, many Jews who have... Um, dispensed with their works and rely on God's Messiah, Jesus, unto salvation. So the Jews had no assurance that they had um, any salvation. They didn't need an assurance because it was resident in them. We're God's chosen people, so the only thing I'm working towards is not my eternal salvation, but for next year's blessing in my crops, in my business, in my home, or whatever. Uh, they, they would do those things uh, necessary, according to their rabbis, to uh, ensure that God will write them in uh, his book of life for the next year. And uh, at, that's at, at uh, Rosh Hashanah. And then uh, 10 days later, after doing all these works of good deeds um, at the Feast of um, the Day of Atonement, they will um, uh, hope that God has sealed them in his book, that their work in the last 10 days especially has been so rock solid for God that he will have no choice but to seal them in the book so that it's an indelible ink and they can't be removed for the next year. That's it. <clears throat> Let's keep moving on then. So imagine when Nicodemus, the, you know, the teacher of the Pharisees, shows up at, at the door in the darkness and Jesus knows exactly what's on his mind because he had, Nicodemus really had no assurance. And Jesus said, 
this is what you need to do. You need to be born again. And that went, huh? I participate in the sacraments or what they called them. Um, you know, the, I can't be born again in any other fashion than what I've already done by following all of these steps. And uh, it was quite a confusing time for him. And Jesus held him accountable to know that. It's, just, it's an Old Testament concept being born again. All right, verse six. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, God's rest, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience, Again, he appoints a certain day, today, saying through David so long afterward, in the words already quoted, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Wow. The uh, Greek word for um, disobedience here. Um, when you break out all the parts of it, if I tried to say it, I would hurt myself. It means to not allow yourself to be persuaded. That's what disobedience is. You're not allowing yourself to be persuaded unto faith or unto action or whatever. And uh, it's also used in uh, chapter 3 and verse 18. Um, and to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient, those who would not allow themselves to be persuaded by what they knew from scripture and saw in the wilderness and in Egypt, and they didn't put those together into faith. And then he goes back to Psalm 95. Uh, again, he appoints a certain day. Today, saying, through David, so long afterward, in the words already quoted, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Many generations after the children of Israel um, died off in the wilderness and their offspring entered the promised land. Um, God sent David, one of their um, kinsmen, to tell them, today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. It's from Psalm 95. God knows human nature. Verse 8, for if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. So Joshua was Moses' successor that was allowed to enter the promised land. And the prospect of rest for Israel to possess the promised land that God had promised Abraham it, it didn't end when Joshua defeated the Canaanites, right? That prospect continued on, and each succeeding generation had an obligation to continue to trust God as a people to assure their own rest in the land. And there were very, very few years out of the couple thousand um, before Christ where they uh, were faithful to God. Most of the time they were unfaithful. And he held them accountable and ultimately he sent them away from the promised land. Essentially turned them over to Satan so that he could bring them back and they will at that time see as a people when they return after the time of Jacob's trouble. Well, just like the implements of the temple and the tabernacle are temporary, they're, they're um, copies of heavenly permanent implements. 
just like the feasts are symbolic testimonials of God's promises and particularly his promises in Messiah um, and his future blessings in the kingdom. In the same way, the Sabbath is a temporary rest um, that has been replaced by the permanent rest in Christ Jesus. Jesus is now our Sabbath rest so that the, the believing Jews um, who believe in Messiah uh, are not bound by all of the, the law because Jesus is our Sabbath rest. He fulfilled the law or brought fullness to the law uh, and therefore it's um, impotent in um, what it does. So for nation Israel, his kingdom rest is still a future reality for the nation. Uh, but for many who are believers in Christ Jesus at this time, um, there is a active present rest that began permanently at the moment of faith. Let's continue on so we can bring this to completion. Verse 10. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. This is a problem theologically with the Roman Catholic theology. It, they, they teach you have to have this continued obedience throughout your life, beginning at the, basically at birth when you're, first baptized as an infant <clears throat> and the jews had the same mentality but god rested and when he, when we enter jesus's rest right rest is that that means rest that's the perfect permanent rest that we can know. Jesus is our Sabbath rest. I grew up <clears throat> in uh, my high school years attending a um, Christian school that was predominantly um, of the Christian Reformed and Reformed church groups um, in that part of Southern California. And I had friends whose parents made them Sunday after church, uh, stay in their bedroom. Basically, they were locked to their bed where they had to just um, either study scripture or um, take a nap or a rest. Uh, they couldn't listen to the radio or do anything. Um, anything else couldn't play games until nightfall. Uh, it was essentially their parents saying that now Sunday is the Sabbath. And completely ignoring um, this, the, that our Sabbath rest is, is Jesus. Okay. Why did Paul work? Remember back in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10, he says, I am what I am, and by God's grace, and I worked harder than all the rest of them. What does it mean when he worked? Why did he do that? To gain his salvation, to maybe gain enough hope that he could enter um, the kingdom at the end. No, he, he worked not to gain anything, but to give back to Christ, uh, give back to God. It was his response. Um, essentially, Paul was. Um, working because who couldn't not work he had to work this was what um, he was created for and uh, all of us are created to do the lord's work in his power um, but he's called us each to do our own work in our own way uh, but it's all for his glory and not for our salvation it's our response to salvation <clears throat> our work should be a joy unto um, 
Is my heart rate going off? No. <laughs> okay. Um, let's go to verse 11. There, uh, let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. The same sort of resistance to being persuaded. Okay. Let's all work together toward that end, not working as in doing things to maybe gain salvation, but in fact to attend to those things. Um, he uses the word apiathia, um, and he used it a few times already in the um, opening chapters of Hebrews. Therefore, he's saying, let's not follow the examples of our forefathers who's resisted being persuaded unto a lack of faith. They resisted being persuaded by what they saw in Scripture okay? and enter into God's rest that he offers for free. Right? Not through genealogy, not through the fact that you are a seed of Abraham, not through observance to the law, but in fact, um, because God has offered this freely in his Messiah, Jesus. Enter into God's rest by holding up what you have heard in the Old Testament, right? what you have heard about Jesus and allow yourself to be persuaded. Uh-oh, they're starting to leave. <laughs> You're taking your bike helmet and leaving. Allow yourself to be, swayed, be persuaded. Um, uniting the knowledge that you have from scripture um, with faith okay verse 12 for the word of god is living and active sharper than any two-edged sword it's the, the the greek words are pas distamos Machaire, two-edged sword, <clears throat> piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. There's nothing more frightening on the battlefield I could imagine than a sword like this in a guy with a steely-eyed resolve in his gaze and knowing that you're about to be um, ash at his hands. It's got to be frightening. And if the word of God is held up and we take it seriously for what it is, for what we know it is, and not ignore it, but allow ourselves to be persuaded, it will lead us right into faith. Right. All right, verse 13. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. How does God see us? He sees us who are in Christ through the lens of his word the written word and the incarnate word, the sword of the spirit. That's how God sees us. He sees us as he sees his son because our righteousness is not of ourselves, but our righteousness is the righteousness of God, which is Christ Jesus. In the context of this book, God will spiritually dissect um, he uses the word in here, um, kritikos, or critical. He will, he will dissect 
each Jew using his word as a spiritual scalpel. And he will do the same with every individual. And when he looks at us, he will see his son, praise God. Chapter six of Romans tells us if we're justified by faith, it's because Jesus died for us. And we should see ourselves as God sees us and live our lives in that fashion. Not holier than thou, but holy because of Christ. Humble and bowed as we go forward. So the Jews, the, their forefathers played a lot of games with God about their ancestry. They continue to do so. Um, they um, tried in their minds to be obedient to the law, but were um, impotent in doing that because the law does not bring righteousness. The law points to our unrighteousness and it points to Jesus. The litmus test here is have they united what they know with their faith in Jesus? And we all have that, that same um, burden of proof. Fortunately, God knows our heart. So we don't have to do a lot of explaining except for all that stuff that's not related to our faith in him. <clears throat> okay, we'll read the last couple of verses. Since then, we have a great high priest. No, we're going to save the high priest for next time. Okay, we'll, we'll save the high priest. Um, because that actually starts a whole new discussion. So, <clears throat> the cause of the Jews' deathly cancer that they have um, is failing to be persuaded, allowing, not allowing themselves to be persuaded, which is disobedience. And um, fortunately, um, Praise God, uh, we who know him have been, had that cancer removed um, from us. It's no longer clogging our arteries, uh, our spiritual arteries. Um, and uh, the Jews, therefore, can know Christ because they've taken the knowledge that they have in their culture having grown up with all of this stuff in, in uh, Sabbath school and Hebrew classes and everything else, and realizing it's not just stories, it's not just something they do because that's in their culture, but in fact, there is a God of the Bible who loves them and is calling them, and he does that for each one of them. Right? And uh, so let's go ahead and close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise you for your son's gift. We praise you for um, bringing us into your fold, even though we did not deserve it, we did not earn it. Um, we praise you because your son offered himself uh, to become my sin and uh, that each one of us uh, shares in that where we were nailed at the cross uh, in the person of Jesus who became our representative. Thank you for his sacrifice. I pray that you would help us to unite the things that we know from your scripture with our faith to strengthen us and uh, help us through every um, aspect of life, not just looking toward the afterlife, when we share that time with you, but realize that we can share that time with you today and right now. It's in your son's great and glorious name we pray. Amen.